Hello, I'm Troy Peoples, Senior Pastor at Delaney Street Baptist Church here in beautiful, sunny Orlando, Florida. We are all about glorifying God, reaching people, and changing lives. After the message, I'll be back to give you some more information about our church and how to grow in your relationship with Jesus. I just want to say that that's a huge um, blessing in my life, and I'm extremely thankful to this church for giving me that opportunity um, just to come bring God's word to God's people. It's a glorious task, and I am extremely humbled by it. Um, but when Mr. Moore just got up here and prayed, um, that his burden for our church is the same burden that I want to talk about today, and just how glorious the Holy Spirit is that he would um, so meld uh, our church's mission together that we all have a burden for that in our culture. And uh, I'm just extremely thankful, and man, it pumps me up for this message this morning. Um, so today we're going to be in Titus chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, go ahead and turn to Paul's letter to Titus chapter 3. And then I will pray as you guys are turning there, um, and then we'll get started. So Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you that you have given us the opportunity and the blessing to come together as your church, to come and to read your word and to glorify you. And God, I just pray that you would, um, that you would come and you, that, and you would indwell us and you would give us understanding of your word so that we might glorify you in all that we do. And God, I pray that you would um, keep me from error this morning and that you would be glorified. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So recently, in the past couple of years, um, Tom Rainier, who is the president of Lifeway, he had an article on his website a few years ago. And in that article, he wanted to, he was compiling some common opinions that non-Christians have about how we as believers interact in the culture. And he came up with three common observations that, that non-Christians have about us. So I'll read these three to you and just think about them. So first, uh, the first common observation was that we as Christians view them, non-Christians, as projects and not as people. Meaning that, we don't, that they don't feel genuinely cared for by us. And then second is that we, as Christians, don't listen. Instead, we only want to be heard. So we, we make it a point to get our beliefs across, but we don't listen to the beliefs of others without judgment. And then third and probably the most devastating is that we, as Christians, don't want true friendships with non-believers. And one commenter even said that her six-year-old son was told by a neighborhood family, that he was not allowed to play with them because he wasn't a Christian. And that should break our hearts as believers here in America. Um, but we're not the only Christians that have struggled with this question. And Christians have been struggling with that since the time of the New Testament. Um, but I think our passage today here in Titus is going to, uh, it's going to help us think through uh, these things. How are we as believers to interact and live in the culture? So to give you a little context about Titus, um, this was a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to one of his young disciples named Titus. Well, the Apostle Paul was church planning on the island of Crete, and he had to go somewhere, so he left his disciple Titus there to help the church um, build up some structure, but then to also help the church know how to live um, amongst themselves as believers and relate to one another, but also how are we to relate to the outside culture. So here in Titus 3, um, we're going to see that because of God's gracious salvation, we must devote ourselves to do good works as missionaries for the benefit of Orlando and beyond. So I'm going to be asking this question today. In a secular society, how are we as the church to live and interact 
with the culture. And I think our text is going to show us that we as believers are to be, first to be ready to do good works. And then second, because we are saved by the gracious work of God alone. And then in turn, we must devote ourselves to good works as missionaries in our culture. So with that, let's dive into our text. Um, again, we're in Titus chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 1. So look at verse 1 with me. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we were too once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and detesting one another. So how are we to live in this culture? Well, Paul first says that we, are to, we must be ready to do good works. And he gives an interesting starting point here. He says that Titus is to remind the church that they're supposed to be doing these things. Well, obviously, the church in that culture... Um, they had kind of got off track. They weren't really doing what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, as the church, they weren't showing good works in their culture. So Paul gives Titus the task. You are to remind them and constantly be reminding them what they're supposed to be doing as believers. And that is a similar message to us today. We need to be reminded that even if we live in a, in a culture that may not like us, we're still to be always ready to do good works in the culture. Well, how are we to do good works? What is, he, what is Paul thinking? Well, first, we're to do good works as good citizens. So here, in verse 1, he says that we're supposed to submit to rulers and authorities. So we're to submit to our government, so the federal, state, and local government. Even if we don't like it, we are to submit to them. And how are we to submit to them? Well, he says that first, we're to obey our government. And that means that we, or God has put the government there in order to promote justice and restrain evil. We kind of looked at that in Ecclesiastes last Sunday night. Um, but we are, that is their God-given job, and that's what they are there to do. So we are to obey them. We are to obey the government when it passes just laws that do that job. And then second, Paul says that we are always to be ready to do good works, meaning that we're to help our government fulfill its God-given role in order to promote justice and restrain evil. But not only are we to be good citizens, but we're to be good neighbors in our community. So that means that we are not to slander uh, people in our culture, even when they don't uh, even when they slander us. And then we're also not to be looking for fights. We're not to be quarrelsome. And that means that, and then Paul says, oh, okay, well, then what are we to do? We're to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. We're to be imitating Christ in our culture. The way that he dealt with non-believers and hostile people was that he was kind towards them and he was gentle to them. He wasn't harsh with them. And that's what we're to do as well. And then why are we to do these things? What are we to remember when we do these good works? Well, Paul says it right there in verse 3. And he gives one of the clearest and most devastating uh, explanations of human sinful depravity that is in the New Testament. And he says that we are to remember, we're to do, do good works remembering our prior sinful condition. So he says that we were also once, meaning that we, that before we get self-righteous when thinking about the culture, we got to remember, this is who we were. So what he's about to say describes us as well as non-believer before, we before we were saved by Christ. So he says that first we were foolish in that we, we exchanged our relationship with God in order to worship ourselves and pursue sin. And we are foolish in that. C.S. Lewis uh, once described it this way, that we are like an ignorant child who wants to go on playing 
with mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. And then we see that we are disobedient. So based on that foolishness, because we're foolish, we are disobedient to God and to his authorities that he has placed over us. And then we are deceived. We're deceived by Satan into thinking that sin will be better than a relationship with God and that we will find joy and satisfaction in sin. So when we see our neighbors finding joy in uh, certain things, not necessarily sinful things, but in things, we envy them and we desire what they have. And it even leads to us, uh, it even leads to malice in our hearts towards them, that we wish ill to them. And then eventually it leads to us hating and hating one another. Um, I mean, you just have to look on social media for evidence of that. So this is who we were. This is who we were before Christ. We're to remember that. Charles Spurgeon, the famous Baptist preacher, once said, Eyes that have wept over our own sin will always be most ready to weep over the sins of others. So we remember our past sin because it kills our self-righteousness. And it compels us to love and compassion towards unbelievers. And the only difference between us and the, on, and the non-believer is that we have experienced grace. We have experienced the grace of God. And when I was thinking how this is, um, is played out in our culture, a real-life example, and I thought of um, Southern Baptists and their work in disaster relief. So if you didn't know, Southern Baptists are the third largest group behind the Red Cross and the Salvation Army to go into disaster areas and assist with disasters. Now that is a huge testimony to um, how we are to live as good citizens and good neighbors in our culture, reflecting the gospel to our culture. And we must look for more opportunities to do that. So are we, as a church and as individual Christians, are we imitating Jesus in our culture? Do we relate to non-believers with self-righteousness or do we relate with love towards them? If our church was gone tomorrow, would our city and our neighbors miss us? Would they know that we're not here? It's a hard question. But here we see that we must be ready to do good works because we were sinners too. But we were shown grace, which leads us to our next um, point. So look with me at verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. So here, Paul is making a good works sandwich, right? So at the beginning of the passage, he talks about good works, and at the end of the passage, he's going to talk about good works. But right here in the middle is the meat of the passage, and this is the central point of Paul's um, passage here in Titus, and it's the central point of his ministry, and, it, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is our foundation for how, or is the foundation for why we do good works in our culture. So he starts out with the conjunction, but. And that conjunction clues us in to the central truth in the Bible. That if we understand it, it'll change our lives for eternity. So he begins in verse 4 by showing us that God the Father is the author of our salvation. Paul used the Greek word uh, philanthropia here. And that word uh, means that God has a special love and a special kindness that is directed towards humanity. It's directed towards you and it's directed towards me. And it reminds us that in the beginning, God had a, we had a perfect relationship with God. But we chose to worship ourselves and we fell into sin and it broke that relationship with God. 
But God didn't leave us in our sinfulness. No, he chose to come up with a plan of reconciliation that one day God himself would come into, uh, he would come and he would save humanity from their sins. And then we see that in verse 5, he said that he saved us. Meaning that God the Father sent God the Son. God the Son, the eternal second person of the Trinity. He came into human history as the man Jesus Christ. And he came and he came as our substitute. Meaning that he lived the life that you should have lived. And that he died the death that you and I deserved for our sinfulness. And that Paul says that we are justified we are justified by his grace. Meaning that on the cross, Jesus took on our sin and he paid for our sins there. And then now we receive his righteousness that now as God looks upon us, he no longer sees our sin and our guilt, but he sees Christ's righteousness. And that is a glorious truth that if we understand, it'll change our hearts. And then he says that, Paul says that we are justified by his grace. Meaning that God's grace and mercy is the only foundation, it's the only basis for our salvation. There is nothing that we contribute to our salvation. It is purely and only by the grace and mercy of God that we are saved. And then in verse 6, he Paul talks about um, that we are saved by the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, the third person of the eternal Trinity, he comes into our lives as we believe, and he does, and he applies our salvation in two ways. First, through the washing of regeneration. And this means, and Paul's not talking about um, that baptism saves here. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that he is alluding to baptism, saying that this that baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality that has happened to us spiritually. And so he's saying that as we are buried with Christ, that our old sinful self is buried and it's washed away. And that as we are raised to new life, we are given a new identity in Christ. And that is the immediate spiritual cleansing of the Holy Spirit. It happens as soon as we believe. And then the second way that the Holy Spirit applies our salvation is through the renewal of the Holy Spirit. And this means that we experience a life, we're not perfect as soon as we become saved. We're we're righteous in the sight of God, but we still struggle with sin. So the Holy Spirit comes in, he indwells in us in order to uh, give us the power um, to slow, I mean to, as we progress through our lifetime, to mature in our relationship with Christ so that as we, um, that we become more conformed to his image. And then, he, and then Paul ends it with by saying that we are heirs accord- with the hope of eternal life. Meaning that God has adopted us as children into his family. And it is as children, like our inheritance is eternal life. And That is the hope that we do good works in our culture. We look to that hope. So our Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all intimately involved in your salvation by grace alone. And that grace is the foundation for why we live in culture with good works. So Christian, all you have is Christ. So rest in Jesus for his grace and salvation. There's nothing that you can do that you don't have to be good enough to come to him. You don't have to be good enough. Um, It is only because of his grace that he has saved you. So we can rest in him in that. We can cast all our cares on him because of that. And let this be your heart song. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way that you choose, and let my song forever be my only boast is you. And if you're not a believer today, 
This is the extent that God went through to offer his salvation to you. That he loved you so much that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish in their sins, but they'll have everlasting life in his name. And he extends that grace to you freely. And if you accept his grace, you'll have new life in his name. So we have seen that we are to be ready to do good works in our culture, and it's because of the gracious work of God alone. And now, as Jesus' people, we are to adopt his uh, mission of reconciliation in the world. So look at verse 8 with me. Paul says that this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And these are good and profitable for everyone. So here we see that we must devote ourselves to good works as missionaries. So he's saying that this is a trustworthy saying. Well, what is? The gospel that he just laid out in the above. Like that is, that, that gospel is true. And if that gospel is a reality in your life, and if you've been saved, then now as a person that is in Christ, we're also to adopt his mission and live as missionaries in our culture. Well, how are we to live as missionaries in our culture? We're to be devoted um, to his mission. And what does that mean for us today? Well, it means that we are to avoid the Christian subculture, that we, we get stuck in this rut of just hanging out with Christians, just befriending Christians, just going to see Christian things, um, and we avoid non-Christians. And that's not saying that we do it intentionally all the time, but unintentionally that happens. And we, and we start to not have any associations with lost people. And that's not how missionaries um, work in their culture. Instead, as missionaries, we're to live with gospel intentionality in the culture. That means that in everyday life, in the everyday rhythms of our lives, we are to make genuine human connections with believers and non-believers in order to share the love of Christ with them and to show them the love of Jesus so when we're at work, when we're at the ball field, when we're at Starbucks, when we're at Target, any of these places, our opportunity, we should be looking for opportunities to make connections with people in order to love them the way that Jesus loved them. And then Paul lastly says that it's good and it's profitable for all men. So we are to be, we're to be missionaries for the benefit of all people in our culture. That means that we're to be meeting the physical and emotional needs of our society in order that we might point people to their greatest need, which is found only in Jesus. So every Christian is to be a missionary. And uh, Pastor Jeff talked about that in the last two weeks, that our one job as believers are to make disciples. And that means that in order to make disciples, we have to be missionaries out in the culture to have encounters with non-believers and share the love of Christ to them so that we can be disciple makers. And we think about this as, mission, I mean, as missionaries. When we think of missionaries, we think you know the International Mission Board missionaries that go into another culture and um, their job there is to make connections with lost people, and they do that by um, doing uh, service projects or um, just making friends uh, with the people in the culture they're in and involved in participating in the culture. And they do that for the purpose of being able to show the love of Christ to people and also to share the gospel with people. in in hopes of eventually building up the church in that area. And that's exactly what we are supposed to be doing. Don't think, don't automatically think missionary means foreign missions only. We're missionaries in 
the United States right now. We are missionaries in Florida. We are missionaries in the greater Orlando area. And that's what we are to be doing. So we are to love non-believers because Christ loved us first. And we're to show that love to others. And we do that by living intentionally as missionaries every single day, doing good works in order to show Christ's love to all people. So this morning, I, I've been trying to answer the question from this passage. How are we to live in the culture as the church? Well, it's because of God's gracious salvation in us that we are to be ready to do good works as missionaries in our culture. But some will say, but some people are in this culture are so nasty to us. Like, they just don't like us. Are, are we still supposed to show love to them? And the answer is yes, we are. Because we were once them too. That we were sinners just like them. And that, aren't you glad that God rescued you from yourself? That's our motivation for doing these good works in our culture. Not to do them for good works sake, but we do them because we want to share the love of Christ with others. And like, even tonight for the Lighthouse Night, I, I can't think of a better way for us to do that. Um, and talking about like, everyday rhythms of life, like that's, you can invite a neighbor to have dinner with you. That's an easy, that's an easy way to show Christ's love to people. And then if you're not a believer this morning, I hope you see the reality of your sinfulness. But I also hope that you have seen the greater reality of the grace and love that God has for you in Jesus Christ. And that he came to save you, not because you're awesome, but because of the great love that God has for you. So he offers his saving work to you freely, and he invites you to come and accept that gift of salvation. So it begs the question, will you receive salvation today? Will you receive forgiveness in Jesus? So let's pray. Lord God, we love you and we thank you for your inerrant word. And that spirit, we, we pray that you illuminate our hearts and you convict us and that you draw us close to yourself and conform us into the image of Jesus. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that, um, that doesn't know you, God, I pray that you, would, um, that you would draw them to yourself and you would um, show them your grace and that they would experience new life in you. And if, and if there's any believers here that are struggling with um, if you love them, like this is, the gospel is the picture of how you love them. And it's glorious, so we can rest in that. Lord, we love you, and we thank you this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope this message from God's Word was encouraging and challenging to you and will help you throughout the week as you grow in your relationship with Jesus. At Delaney, we want to help you take your next step of faith, and we know how difficult that can be just watching a message on screen every week. So we invite you to come visit us on Sunday morning and experiencing worshiping God together with other like-minded followers of Jesus. Delaney is a community that passionately loves and cares for each other. You can find out more about our church family at delaneychurch.org. And we look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.